Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to June. I hope everybody had a great holiday this week. And we are doing Q&As this Friday. So as you know, I receive comments on videos uh, via email, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, I'm very low tech, so we're just going to kind of bundle through these Q&As. If you have a question you'd like to ask me, feel free to comment down below. How do you choose between a work W-2 set schedule or a 1099 flexible schedule? So that is a good question. It is one we've talked about a few times. So what you need to do before you even start looking for a job, you really need to assess your family needs and your personal needs. So for example, if we have a single parent or a parent, two parents, and they either have a special needs child, cannot find daycare, uh, daycare hours are very strict, there's no leeway on it, then, and if you both want to work or you both need to work, then a 1099 company where you can set your own schedule day by day would be better. Now, the thing about 1099, you know there's no benefits and they don't take the taxes out. However, you do tend to make a little bit more money per hour. Depends on where you go. Now, if you are somebody who needs the benefits, um, you can go with companies like, I know if you need overnight hours, I know teleperformance sometimes have overnight customer service rep hours. Um, there's a couple of other companies out there, but I haven't seen a lot of job postings lately. Those overnight hours really get picked up very, very, like, quick. It's crazy quick. So there's that. Um, now, if you are looking for growth and promotion, you definitely want that hourly, salary, uh, hourly wage or a salary. Um, and another thing we do want to touch on, and this has been in the Facebook groups a little bit and I posted there, but I do want to bring it here to YouTube. A lot of you, you know, we've gone through the pandemic, we've gone through a lot of changes in how employment works. However, I get a lot of feedback. I've done customer service for years. I get a lot of feedback of, I hate the phones, I hate the callers, I hate the micromanagement, this sucks, I'm quitting. And they're barely out of training, barely into production. So one thing is, is to assess whether you can handle that job type. Maybe you need to go to claims where it's not phones. Maybe you need to do some outbound calling where you control it a little bit more or you do something that isn't customer facing. For those that can wing it out for at least six months to a year, you can pivot that customer service role into something better. Um, I know a lot of people who start out a customer service on the phones all the time, then they become a SME, a subject matter expert, then they become a team lead or go to Q&A or become a trainer. There are a lot of options. So for example, Broadpath promotes from within. T-Tech promotes from within. I know a few people at Teleperformance that have been promoted off the phones and within. So you really need to sharpen your skills a bit. It's not like, oh, she's so good on the phones, we're keeping her on the phones forever. No, because you could always leave and get a pay raise. There's always somebody paying more, okay? And you can accept and understand the minimum amount of money you need to make per hour to pay your bills. Go from there and be like, okay, so say I only accept $15 an hour. I can't accept anything less than that, but I can't accept more. So you start out as a customer service rep. Six months pass by, you're like, hey, listen, you know, we've been doing these one-on-ones with my trainer, my team lead. I'm interested in growth. And they're like, okay, so let's make you a chat assistant so you're doing three to five chats at a time and that's just basically how you build it you need to stick your name out there and you need to network a little bit so if you have social mixers go to them you know um, Broadpath has the beehive community participate 
you know, sharpen your skills, you know, spend some time in between calls or as you're going to calls looking into the knowledge base articles. You don't have to know the answer to everything. You just need to know where to look to find the answer. All right, and that's enough of me spooling on that one. Okay, what have you learned from work from home experience? You are more productive. And work from home is not for everybody. Um, I used to, I'm older, I'm in my 40s. So you youngins, I'm not gonna say you don't wanna work. Um, but there's a, a group of people, I'm not going to say a lot, but there's a group of people and I think we can all um, understand that. We've all had that one person who has been in training and doesn't know how to turn on their monitor, move their mouse, control F to find something. We have people who have their baby mamas, baby daddies in the background drinking not dressed or not dressed appropriately. We have people who have dogs barking in the same room. Um, and God bless, you know, uh, and this was an anonymous post on Reddit, so I'm reading through the work from home there. Her, this person's toddler grabbed the monitor and threw it on the floor. So her work said, okay, we're going to replace it, but if it happens again, well, you're going to have to pay for it. Guess what the toddler did? Okay, um, work is not a replacement for child care. However, if you do not have an option for child care, um, a couple people have been brainstorming, get a playpen, set them up with their YouTube channels or whatever shows they like, set them up with their bottle or a sippy cap, set them up with a snack if they're old enough to be left alone with a snack, check on them during breaks, check on them during lunch, Check out on the last break, and when you get off, you can finish checking on your child and go on with your day. Um, a lot of people have reached out on mommy and me groups through Facebook, and they have, like, for example, maybe somebody's taking your child during the day, and then you take their child in the evening, or you take their child during the weekday ends, or, you know, have some sort of thing going on. Um, there's a lot of people who will cash on the table babysit. So get involved in your community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever you're using. So that's one thing. And for our last question, I didn't do many questions this time. How much should I hold back for taxes? And that's a 1099 uh, question there. So I live in the state of Texas and I do not pay state income tax. So if you pay state income tax, you need to reach out to someone else about how much you need to do for that. For federal taxes, I hold back $30 out of every $100 made. You can put it in an interest-bearing savings account, just don't touch it. Also, you can pay your taxes quarterly or annually if you're 1099. A great tool to do that would be to go ahead and get QuickBooks Self-Employed. Um, Intuit owns both them and TurboTax, and I have used QuickBooks in the past to decide how much I need to pull back. QuickBooks will take in your income, deductions, amounts, whatever, and they'll let you know quarterly you owe this or you can do it annually. All right, everybody, thank you so much, and I will see you next time.